Okay, so y'all have fun on the exam. How was it? Not enough time? <clears throat> uh, I'm still figuring out the best way to give exams where you use R during the exam. Um, I, we haven't graded them yet, but we will grade them. And once I see the grades, I'll do whatever I need to do to make it equitable across everybody. Possibilities would include, uh, I could accept the highest score on both of your exams. So if you made a, if we didn't have enough time on this one, uh, but you do better on the second one, um, I'm open to counting that second one twice. Um, I've also considered letting you, uh, after they've been graded, give you the opportunity to earn some points back if you uh, complete it and resubmit it. I'm not guaranteeing I'll do that, but um, I'll say what I say every semester, which is if it was hard for you to finish in time, it was hard for everybody to finish in time. And I'm not going to fail the whole class. So, <clears throat> let's see. I'll probably talk about the um, solutions to the exam on Monday. So we'll spend a few minutes going through the solutions on Monday. But <clears throat> starting today, I wanted to get us going on our next batch of material, uh, which is going to be about correlated data. So this class is uh, lots and lots of regression. And we've learned the basic um, classical regression model, linear regression model, um, where we've made this assumption of IID residual terms, which means that the individuals in our uh, data set are, are viewed as independent draws. Now we're going to start thinking about what if we don't have in independent uh, realizations in our data set. That can happen if you have paired data, if each individual is treated with a control and then later a treatment, then those two measurements on the same individual are correlated with each other and the, the regression stuff we've learned so far won't be appropriate because we'll see soon that the standard errors of the regression coefficients will be wrong when there's correlation. Um, pairing is one common mechanism of uh, correlation. Longitudinal data or time course data is another common source where each individual is measured uh, at multiple times over time, where the interest is specifically in um, modeling changes over time. Longitudinal data are useful when we're specifically interested in what happens over time. And yet another common way that we can have correlation is spatial correlation. So if, uh, if we have measurements of something uh, that is spatially related to other measurements, then it would be expected that measurements that are closer to each other spatially will be more correlated, more similar than measurements that are further apart. So I've had people in this class before, for example, who were in um, fisheries and um, wildlife services. I forget what it's called on campus, but <clears throat> they you know, would study uh, plant life on a hillside. And they would have multiple, uh, maybe you <clears throat> break a, a hillside up into a grid of small plots of land, and you go and measure uh, growth characteristics at each plot. Um, Doing that induces correlation. So if we had a plot of land and we broke it into a grid like this, and every single cell in there, we, would, we were going to collect data, then uh, say this cell right here will be more correlated with these than, um, say, these. So we need some way to tell the model, tell the regression model, about who's related to who in our data. And we're going to need to do something about uh, what is the <clears throat> um, nature of the correlation. Is this time course correlation? Is it spatial correlation? Um, or what? So let's start talking about correlated data. 
Uh, I'm going to skip the first couple of slides here and jump to slide five. This is the, the basics of what we mean by independence and correlation. Uh, in the usual regression model, we say that the residuals are IID, usually or classically we say normal, mean zero, and a common variance sigma squared. So that first letter there, the I, means independent. <coughs> so let's define what independence means. For two arbitrary random variables, call them just U and V, independence means the <coughs> joint probability function, a PMF or a PDF, probability of seeing this U and that V simultaneously, if that can be factored into a product of marginal probabilities, then that is the definition of independence. Two random variables are independent if their joint probability function can be pro uh, factored into the product of marginal probability functions. <coughs> um, one thing that that tells us immediately, let me draw something on the board again. If um, we have u and v, two random variables, <coughs> um, and we have a joint probability function, f, u, and v, and we have marginal probability functions, f u of u and f v of v. So the difference between the joint and the marginal <coughs> is that the joint is speaking to probabilities of pairs. u equals this and, and v equals that. As opposed to the two marginal ones, this right there is just for u with, without, without respect to what v is. Similarly, this is just for V without respect to what U is. One operation that uh, is helpful to look at to understand independence is a conditional <coughs> probability function. So a conditional probability, like let's say U given V, probability that u equals little u given that v equals little v. The conditional probability is given by joint probability divided by the marginal for the thing we are conditioning on. That's definition of conditional probability. Joint probability divided by marginal for the thing we're conditioning on. If u and v are independent, so if u and v are independent, that's what I mean by that little uh, upside down t symbol, then the um, joint probability function in the numerator can be factored into product of marginals over f v of v. And then those two f v's cancel out. So that under independence, we have that the conditional probability of u given v is the same thing as the marginal probability of u without respect to v. So independence you can think of it like the probabilities that apply to u do not depend on the values of v, and vice versa. Okay, so we are now um, getting into the data types where that's not the case. When it's not the case, then you have to take care to deal with the correlation correctly. I'll show you examples of why soon. Uh, okay, so independence, you know what that means now. And let's define a couple of um, 
terms, a covariance, we know what a variance is, that's a measure, a quantification of the variability of one variable. It's an expected square deviation between the random variable and its mean. For example, the variance of u is defined as the expected value of u minus its mean squared. <coughs> That's a variance. And a covariance between, say, u and v is um, similar, but instead of an expected squared deviation, it's an expected cross product or cross product kind of calculation. U minus its mean times V minus its mean. Covariance is a mathematical definition of a variance like quantity that instead of speaking to one variable, it speaks to joint variability of two. So here is the definition of a covariance. And then a more familiar quantity probably is a correlation, which is defined in terms of a covariance. A covariance, um, if you, well, I won't go through there, but a covariance can be any number between minus infinity and infinity. A correlation is a standardized covariance. It is the covariance, but then we divide by the product of the standard deviation of u and the standard deviation of v. What that accomplishes is it transforms covariances, which can be any real number, negative infinity to infinity, it transforms them to be limited to minus 1 up to 1. A correlation must be between minus 1 and 1. And the closer it is to 1, the more strongly positively correlated the two variables are. That means as u gets big, v tends to get big also. As u gets small, v tends to get small. A negative correlation would go the other way. As u gets big, v gets small, and vice versa. Positive correlation um, is easy to imagine. Things like height and weight. Taller you are, the heavier you tend to be. Negative correlation is not as common, but it still shows up. One example would be uh, if you have a car, a used car, and you're going to sell your car. Think about the age of the car and the price you could get back. The older the car, the less money you're going to tend to get. Mm -hmm. So the question was about um, those Pearson, uh, a Pearson correlation coefficient or a Pearson R that is often uh, provided by software. That's an estimate of this. This right here is a um, defined in terms of expectations. So these are like parameters. These are unknown quantities of the population, just like a mean or a variance. In practice, we have to estimate those types of things. And the Pearson statistic is one way to estimate correlation. Okay, so those uh, Pearson correlation and Spearman correlation, all these kind of things are like different estimates of these coefficients? All the different estimates of correlations are trying to estimate this quantity, this parameter, in using different algorithms. Some of them are more robust to uh, assumptions. Some of them are uh, yeah, better or worse at certain characteristics. If you wanted to estimate the correlation, you would just need to put, you would need to estimate all the terms there, which you can do. If the covariance between u and v is this expected value, you could estimate the mean of u with a sample mean of u. You could estimate the mean of v with a sample mean of v. And you could estimate this expectation with an average of your sample. So you could have a sample statistic that estimates covariance, 
And then you can plug in estimates here as well to get an estimated correlation. Uh, okay. A little bit of math to say the covariance between u and v can be written as this quantity, which simplifies to that quantity. Let me show you that real quick. Covariance between u and v, expected value of u minus mu u, v minus mu v. So that is expected value. And then I'm just carrying out the, the products. uv minus mu u v minus mu v u plus mu u mu v. So we have expected value of u v minus mu u expected v minus mu v expected u and the expected value of a constant is just the constant. Now we know what expected u and expected v are. So this, uh, this term right here is going to be mu u times mu v. This one right here is going to be mu v times mu u. So we have minus 2 mu u mu v plus mu u mu v or expected u v minus the product of the means. Covariance turns into this. If they are independent, if u and v are independent, then it turns out the expected value of u v, that equals a double integral. So the, the expected value of a product of two random variables is double integral possibility times density. This is just a two-dimensional expected value calculation. The key, what I want to show here is that because they're independent, this joint probability can be factored into the product of the marginals. And then the integral can be factored into two integrals. And so we end up with, if u and v are independent, then expected u v is equal to the product of the indip individual means. And that means this right here, so under independence, if u and v are independent, we saw that the expected value of u times v is the product of their means. So if um, <coughs> u and v are independent, then they are uncorrelated. If covariance is zero, then correlation is zero because it would be zero divided by stuff. So independence tells us that our um, uh, uncorrelation tells us that our data, sorry, back the other way around. If independence tells us our data are uncorrelated, but not necessarily the other way around. There's a minor technical point. You can cook up examples where there is no correlation but the data are dependent. So just be careful about the directionality there. If they're independent, they're uncorrelated. Let's do another calculation involving correlations. Um, if they are not uncorrelated, covariance is not zero, let's think about linear combinations of our variables. We're going to care about linear combinations because things like a sample mean, uh, regression coefficients, a lot of the statistics that we work with 
can be expressed as linear combinations of random variables. So we want to be able to do calculations of means and variances with correlated data. Let's consider this arbitrary linear combination of u and v. a and b would be known constants that we specify. Those are not random. The expected value of that is equal to, um, you can pull constants outside of an expected value calculation because an expected value is just an integral. So any constants inside can be pulled out. That means that the expected value of this linear combination is the linear combination of the expected values. Um, the variance is a little more complicated. Long story short, with correlated data, it's easy to estimate uh, regression coefficients, means, mean differences. You don't have to do anything special to estimate. The harder part is the variances. Variances are affected by covariances. So the variance of, a, of the linear combination um, can be written in this form. If you, if you wrote the whole calculation out, you could derive that it equals this form, which is uh, You can pull constants out of variance calculations also, but because a variance is an integral of a squared quantity, an expected squared quantity, to pull the constant out, you have to square it. So the variance of a u is actually a squared times the variance of u. The variance of this linear combination is a squared variance of u plus b squared variance of v and we have a cross product kind of term, a covariance between u and v. When they are independent, when u and v are independent, the variance of their sum like this would be just the first two pieces. There would be no cross product term. So this illustrates that we're not going to have to work hard to estimate means but we are going to have to think hard about variances and therefore standard errors and standard deviations. Here is one um, kind of correlated data. Suppose we have a sample of size n from some population. Suppose that um, every individual that we sampled has the same mean and the same variance. <clears throat> but they are not independent. So y1 through yn are not iid. They are in, um, identically distributed, but they're not independent. Because we're saying the correlation is non-zero. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hypothesize a, a scenario where we have n observations. They all have the same mean, they all have the same variance, and every pair of observations is correlated with a correlation of rho. So every pair has the same correlation. If the correlation is rho, and the variance of every one of the variables is sigma squared, then, let me write on the board here, in the context of our uh, y1 to yn with expected yi equal mu and variance of yi equal sigma squared for all i. And if the correlation between yi and yj equals rho for any i not equal to j. Then the covariance um, between yi and yj, we know that the correlation 
equals the covariance divided by um, the product of the standard deviations of the two variables. So I can say square root variable yi times variable or variance of yj. But both of those are sigma squared. If I take the square root of their product, we have covariance divided by sigma squared. <clears throat> and therefore, we can figure out what the covariance is by taking the correlation and multiplying by sigma squared. So sigma squared, correlation, yi, yj. That's what I have here. Uh, so we said that the correlation was rho for every single pair. For these data, we're going to introduce, for data like this, correlated data, we're going to introduce a new way of thinking about the variability, the variation in the data. Namely, we're going to introduce this capital sigma to represent the matrix containing all the variances and all the covariances between every pair. Capital sigma is, in this case, an n by n matrix. And the diagonal elements, those sigma squares, sigma square, dot, 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 sigma square, the diagonal contains the variances. So think about like uh, the, the second row, second column, capital sigma, we might call it underscore 2, 2 for second row, second column. Think of that as the covariance between y2 and itself. The covariance between uh, a variable and itself, the definition of covariance was this cross product. But since they're both the same quantity, this just equals that. And that's the variance of y. Capital sigma n by n matrix has um, the variances in the diagonal. In this case, we said every variable had the same variance. In the off-diagonal pieces are the covariances. And we said in this case, every covariance was rho sigma squared. This is a symmetric matrix. When we have IID data, independent data, the, the correlations are all zero, then capital sigma is called diagonal in the sense that um, the only non-zero elements are on the diagonal and everything else is zero. Classical linear regression, um, could be expressed with a capital sigma matrix like this. In fact, in the regression um, notes, let me pull them up real quick. In the regression notes, when we started talking about uh, model matrices and matrix notation for representing uh, our data, we express the model like this. Y is X beta plus epsilon. And we said the variance of the, um, the variances and covariances could be represented by capital sigma. But because we were doing usual classical regression, we could simplify this to be sigma squared times 
what's called the identity matrix. So identity matrix um, if no, or let's say if rho equals zero, then sigma simplifies to just the variances down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And you can write that as sigma squared times one, one, dot, 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 one, zeros everywhere else. That is the same thing as saying sigma squared i. That matrix on the far right with ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else is called identity matrix. <coughs> We can't do that anymore because we're going to have correlated data. So we're going to be stuck with these kinds of uh, covariance matrices. OK, now let's think about what happens. If this is our data, if we have data that are correlated like this, then what are the impacts? What happens if we don't handle this correctly is what we're going to look at initially. Why do we care about correlation? <coughs> the expected value, let, let's think about estimating the mean. We have data, there's a mean, and there's a variance. Suppose we wanted to do inference on the mean. Without any correlation, it's easy. We do um, a t-test or a t-based confidence interval. Um, our usual estimate of the sample mean is, or I'm sorry, the usual estimate of the population mean is the sample mean. Call it y bar. Add up all the y's and divide by n. It turns out that the expected value of y bar, even though our data are correlated, is still mu. The reason for that comes back to this slide. The expected value of a linear combination is equal to the linear combination of the expected values. So if I want to compute y bar, that's equal to 1 over n i equal 1 to n y i, which is a linear combination of the y's. That's a constant times y1 plus a constant times y2, and so on. So the expected value of y bar equals the linear combination of the expected values. And each of those observations came from the same distribution. They all had the same mean. So this is 1 over n times n mu, or just mu. Y bar is unbiased as an estimate of mu, but the variance is um, not unbiased. The variance of Y bar, uh, we can figure it out pretty easily with matrix notation. So let's think about what is the variance of y bar under the model that we're considering right here. y bar can be written um, as up top using a vector uh, notation. So I'm, I'm saying that y bar can be written as a vector of ones transpose the vector of y's divided by n. That looks like 1, 1, dot, 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 n ones as a row vector times y1, y2, dot, 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 y n, like that. So that equals y bar. Um, if you carried out that calculation, it'd be 1 times y1 plus 1 times y2 plus dot 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 divided by n.
Okay, so what is the variance of y bar? Based on that representation, it equals the variance of 1 transpose y over n. A constant, like that division of n, can be pulled out of a variance calculation if you square it. So I'll pull that out, and we're left with variance of 1 transpose y. We saw in the regression notes um, that for an arbitrary random variable u, if you pre-multiply u by some constant vector, we saw that the variance of that is equal to a transpose variance of u times a. That's a general result that we can use right here. Applying that right here, I have 1 over n squared, and then we're going to have 1 transpose variance of y, 1. And that middle variance of y is actually a matrix because y is a vector. The variance of y is the covariance matrix. It's the total collection. Variance is down the diagonal, covariance is on the off diagonals. So I can write this as 1 over n squared, 1 transpose sigma 1. And we know what sigma is. Sigma is uh, that thing. If you did that operation on the whiteboard, 1 transpose times that n by n matrix, and then times a, col a column of 1s, I'll let you play with verifying it. But what you get <coughs> um, is an expression like this one. So if you, if you do the arithmetic and pay attention to what's in each of the rows or each of the columns of capital sigma, think about adding them up by doing a 1 transpose and then taking the result of that and multiplying by another vector of 1s. You add up all the pieces inside the matrix. Um, so long story short, under this model of data, correlated data, the variance of y bar is equal to this expression. So it is sigma squared plus n minus 1 rho sigma squared divided by n. In the IID case, when we have independence uncorrelated data, then this rho is 0 and that whole second term goes away. So the variance that we're used to for a sample mean is this one. STATS 101 tells you that the variance of y bar is this population variance divided by the sample size. The other extreme of possibilities would be if the um, data are perfectly correlated with each other. If they are perfectly correlated with each other, then they are all the exact same number. If I have independent information, then the variance of the sample mean is less than the population variance. I have a more precise estimate of the mean, the bigger my sample size. Under perfect correlation, I get no benefit at all for taking multiple measurements because they're all the exact same measurement. And the variance of y bar is the exact same as the population variance. And everywhere in between, between rho equals 0 and rho equal 1, somewhere in between uncorrelated and perfectly correlated, you're going to have something in between these. The more correlation there is, the bigger the variance of y bar is going to be under this particular t 
type of correlated data model. So that's, this is intended to be an illustration of what happens when there is correlation in the data. Um, if we had correlated data, but we treated it as if there was no correlation, we would use this um, as the basis for computing a standard deviation for y bar. If we did a t-test or a t-based confidence interval, for example, we would be using this. But if there's correlation, that's too small. When there's positive correlation within all the individuals in your data set, like we have, then the usual variance is too small. That means you're going to have anti-conservative inference. Conservative inference would be, you told me this was a 95% confidence interval, but it's really a 99% confidence interval. Anti-conservative would be, you told me this was a 95% confidence interval, but it's really a 80% confidence interval. You'd rather be conservative than anti-conservative. This speaks to what I was just saying. We need to be careful. We need to be, um, as a data analyst, it is your job to query the person or persons who are creating the data. Ask, how did you collect the data? What do each of your individuals in your data set represent? Are these independent draws from a, a population? Or are they correlated somehow? And it's common to have there be correlation in the data that's not really clear to you off the, on the, uh, from the get-go because your collaborator may not know what is different about correlated data or not correlated data. One way correlation creeps into real data sets these days is um, suppose you're studying uh, an animal model like mice and you expose them to some uh, carcinogen or something and then you watch them for two months sacrifice them and, um, anal and get an assay of uh, number of aberrant cells in their colon or something. So here's my Excel spreadsheet with um, 30 rows, one per mouse. But what wasn't told to me was the first three observations are technical replicates of the same mouse. And then the next three observations are technical replicates of, that, of the second mouse. In other words, each mouse was assayed three times. I don't really have a sample of size 30 in that case. It's closer to the case that I have a sample of size 10. So if I just threw my 30 numbers into R and asked for a confidence interval or something, it would be wrong in that case. And that's kind of a subtle uh, issue. I recommend that if you have data or you're working with somebody who's giving you data, you be careful about asking, tell me how you created your data. What do these individual numbers represent? Is this a new mouse that you raised from scratch? Is it a new culture of the cells that you're studying? Or did you do every, a preparation once and then just take 10 spoonfuls out of that one preparation? There's a distinction between biological replicates and technical replicates. Okay, um, what I want to start us on in our last couple minutes here is an R script that illustrates some of the correlated data stuff. So core underscore script dot R is on eCampus. <clears throat> and let's simulate <clears throat> some correlated data. Um, I'm going to have a sample of size 100. We'll do the bootstrap at one point down below, so I'm setting B to be a number, 500. Um, mu, we're going to set to be 5. Population standard deviation, 1.5. And common pairwise correlation rho, I'm going to set it to be 0.95 for now. So highly correlated. These are the exact same, this is the exact same um, model as this one. Everybody has the same mean, everybody has the same variance, and every pair has the same correlation row. 
let me make a picture real quick and we'll revisit it on Monday. Uh, I'm going to simulate data two different ways. One is ignoring the correlation. So Y underscore IND is an IID sample. Uh, y underscore core, I'm generating from a multivariate distribution. Multivariate normal, that is allowing for correlations. Let me run this. Thanks. Um, we're almost out of time, so I'm just going to make a picture that we can briefly discuss here. <clears throat> uh, okay, so blue represents one simulated data set that is, has no correlation. The mean is 5, and you see the blue profile bobbing around 5. The variance is equal to sigma squared, and there is no correlation. So the blue represents IID. The red represents the correlated data. And you can see that they do not vary as much because they're highly correlated with each other. Wherever our first draw from this distribution was, the rest of them are going to tend to track that pretty closely because they're all really highly correlated. So on one simulated data set of 100 observations, this, in, this correlated data is misleading. It's not located in the right place, and its variability is much smaller than we would think it would be if there was no correlation. If I reran this, we'd see a different sample. The blue is doing similar things, bobbing around five like it should. The red, again, is essentially like one random draw from the distribution, and then it just tracks that really closely because of the correlation. Do it again and again. So it keeps this distinction. And I'll show you more from this script on Monday about how this type of phenomenon translates to uh, operating characteristics of our inferential techniques. P-values are going to be wrong. Confidence intervals are going to be wrong when we have this correlated data stuff. So we need some more specialized methods to deal with the correlation. OK, yes. Okay, the x-axis in this case is 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 100. One tick mark for every individual. We simulated the sample of size 100. Um, the blue dots are independent of each other, so they're not, uh, they, they take values without respect to what the other values are. Whereas the red sample, 100 observations, also from the distribution with mean 5, they are, track, they are sticking in, the, in one place because they're so correlated. They don't have the freedom to jump from, say, here, way down there. They are so correlated that they're just going to stay in one place. So from sample to sample, here's a sample where um, the correlated data look unbiased because they're centered at the right place. But that's just 
random chance. Here's another one where just by chance we got a realization up here and everything followed that one. The IID data is uh, bobbing around the right place every time. We'll revisit this and talk more about it um, next week. Okay? So, see you Monday. <laughs>